Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DMV Business Show. I'm your host, Odo Sevilla, and today I have a very special guest for you. Her name is Iris Veronica Jimenez. She's the culinary director and managing partner of La Casita Pupuseria. Welcome to the show, Iris. Hola. Hello, Otto. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thank you again for joining us. I really appreciate you taking out the time. Of course. Of course. I'm glad to be able to come on and 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 be on your show and talk a little bit about my journey. Yeah. So before we go into where you're from and everything else, if you can give the audience, please, here is just a, a brief general overview of what is La Casita Pupuseria, please. So La Casita Pupuseria is... Uh, I, would, I would say a, a restaurant, obviously, but it is a, I would, uh, kind of like a fast, casual restaurant cultural experience. And that's the way I best describe it, just because I think beyond a restaurant and food, we really try to focus in on all our locations, on building in culture and uh, education and understanding of food. And I think that's kind of how we've grown our business. Um, past the time of, of building it with my parents, which initially started it many years ago. Oh, so it all started with your parents. Yes, it all started with them in the 80s, actually. So um, when they came to this country from El Salvador, and my father came in 1976, um, and then my mother came shortly after. Um, they obviously came with the American dream like everybody else, right? Just really wanting to build something, build a new home for their family. And um, at that point, I had not been born. Um, only my brother, my oldest brother, Mario, had been born at that time. And um, they came and they really wanted, you know, they worked in the restaurant industry. They, they did all the jobs. They were dishwashers and they, um, you know, worked in the kitchen. They worked as busters. I mean, they had a lot of experience. Um, my father worked in the market. Um, Casa Peña, which was very popular in the Mount Pleasant area in D.C. Um, so he they really had a lot of experience in that field. So it was something that it was it was very interesting to them, very like something that they could possibly do in, in this country. And it's actually funny because my mom had a market in her house. Um, they had a house and then like a little market in the house and they, you know, sold all the basics and everything there. So my mom has actually come from an entrepreneurial family herself because and my father was a farmer. So you could say he was an entrepreneur himself as well because he kind of grew his his, you know, watermelons and kind of worked for himself. So they were kind of always in that world. So it only made sense that they would come and be entrepreneurs here in the D.C. area. And so, yeah, and they started. And when my uncle arrived um, in the 80s, you no, know, they he basically kind of joined forces with him. And they're like, what do we do? Like, what, what do you think would be? And they were like, should we open up a clothing store? They're like, no, like we have no experience in that. What are we gonna do? He's like, oh, well, I've, I've heard some people have had success. But they're like, let's just open up a market. That's something that we know how to do. We, you know, you've been working in the Casa Peña and you, you know, we have experience from growing up because that was my um, my mom's brother. So obviously they both had that experience. And so that's what they did. They opened up a Gavilan grocery um, in the 80s, 1984, I believe it was, and um, on Mount Pleasant. And it was, that's how they did it. They started out that location literally with no like background on opening up a, a business. It's just, they just kind of went in and just started working and it was, very extensive, very intensive, very hard work. I mean, like working all day long, very, very hard. So it was, you know, the experience for them, I do recall, you know, growing up in that, because by that point I was around eight years old and I started to see, you know, my, my siblings and I would go and we realized we didn't have a traditional life, like my, my friends and the people that I knew, like their parents had like nine to five jobs and they didn't, you know, they were not considering, oh, like, yeah, I have to go on the weekend with my parents to the store or, you know, my parents are like, with this, they're like the store, like, okay, you know, what is that? Like the, the concept of small businesses was not, was not commonplace, like not something people really talked about um, at that time. It was mostly just, you know, your traditional jobs. And so for me, that's kind of where I was kind of introduced to that world as long as, as well as my brothers who are also my partners still today. 
Um, and um, we just kind of went. We went with them to work. They showed us the way. They, 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 you know, we started to understand customer service. We started to understand how do they work with their vendors and kind of see that going with them shopping um, to the union market, um, you know, where we would, they would buy all the necessities they needed for the store. So we saw that and we really were, I was personally very intrigued by it because I thought this is just, this is such an unusual way, right? To kind of make a living, but this is what the way they did it, you know? And we obviously kind of grew in that and they kind of grew in that. And then they decided to expand and start building restaurants. And they started to do some Salvadorian Tex-Mix restaurants, which was the, rest, the, the kind of restaurants everyone kind of did at that time. You know, it was like Salvadorian and Tex-Mix because Salvadorian was very niche. It was very ethnic, you could say it wasn't something traditional like you would find anywhere it was like okay we know pupusas but that's it like that's really the only salvadoran food that people really knew of at that time and so we really they started to build kind of that idea of like okay let's introduce salvadoran but let's do a text mix which is something that everybody knows so they did that they opened el gavilan restaurant they opened el paso Cafe, which actually both still exist, um, which is we're talking about 30 something years of this, but which is great. I mean, that's an amazing, an amazing, um, you know, accomplishment that they still are there. So um, they open up those. They open up a couple more grocery stores, which were also called El Gavilan, kind of now starting to experiment with market deli concept, which was very popular in that time and kind of introducing some Salvadoran dishes from soups, sopas, and tamales, and um, carne asadas, and just adding some other elements um, into the menu and start to see, wait, you know what? People are really starting to be more interested in the food than the actual market, because the market concept was changing. Obviously, before, there were only small markets, like little small markets, mercados, um, bodegas, where you could get your, you know, all the things that you had back at home, all the necessities. But now you were getting these huge markets that were starting to be built um, that had a larger selection, better prices, obviously. And then also stores like Giant and Safeway were having these Latin areas in their, in their stores as well, where people could get their food as well. So we realized that, you know, that was changing, like the, the concept of a market, people were not really going to that, you know, a specific small market concept anymore. So they started, you know, to add more food items. And at that point, um, they started to realize, well, this is making more sense. And it wasn't, it was organic. It wasn't something they were considering. They were never really thinking opening up a pulseria ever. That was not even in the idea for them. So as we grew up, we all kind of did our own things. I, I went to George Mason. I studied communication. Then um, I I worked kind of in a private sector for some time. My other brothers did some other things. At that point, my parents were already looking to get out of the kind of um, the business that they were in, which was market and the Salv Salvadoran Tex-Mex restaurant. They were trying to expand, do something more that focused in on our family, our story and our food. So they were like, La Casita was born basically from that desire of just really feeling like that was the direction we wanted to take the business. Like we we want to kind of go back, you know, versus, you know, we want to go back in time to where it was just the family and the concept of just focusing in on that kind of food. So that's what we did. And they, you know, we they started it, um, you know, initially with La Casita um, and we kind of all sat down. I do remember the conversation and my parents were like, well, we wanna open up a new spot. We want us to do it together as a family. Um, how do we do this? You know what I mean? And I was like, well, you know, um, <laughs> I think it's a great idea. I, I like the idea, but you know, obviously it's gonna be very new for us, you know? And they're like, yeah, you know, you guys, obviously I know you're doing your own things right now. We're gonna to have to figure out how we can still all be involved, but 
you know, let's, let's, let's figure it out. And we all sat down together and we thought of the name La Casita because my brother saw the location in Silver Spring and it looked like a house. And, <laughs> and he was like, wait, this looks like a little house. Let's call it La Casita. And it makes sense. It's our family spot. It's something where we want families to feel comfortable and multi multi-generational homes to feel comfortable coming, which was very common in our families. You know, you had the grandma and the mom and the kids all living together under one home. So we wanted to create kind of that space for, um, for our customer. And that's kind of how that happened. And as my siblings and I grew up and started to be more involved, we started to focus in in another direction, which is what I've told you about, which is kind of bringing back the concept of culture and education and really understanding how we, um, especially being first generation, um, myself and my brother, my youngest brother, Jaime, um, who is, you know, the operations manager and um, my other brother, John Angel, and Mario, obviously, who's born in Salvador, how we can all make it a part of our lives. Because I think that even with like a family business, which is what we are, it has to go through generations. You know, in my parents' generation, it was very like, we're going to do this, but not really going back with any background. You're not looking at target audience. You don't care about demographics. You're not thinking about social media. You're not thinking about email lists. I mean, like that was not even on their radar. They were not thinking about promotion or PR or marketing or anything of that matter. So I think that they opened up a business in a time where that wasn't important. But as we move now, we're in 2021 and we just are, you know, are going through the throes of a pandemic. We realize more than ever how important it was to be able to have a system that is built on being able to survive because that is how we were able to survive. The fact that we had a strong social media presence, the fact that we had this marketing built in, the fact that we understood what our customers wanted during this time, the fact that we were able to be within our community helping and giving back. I think all those things were the ways that all the restaurants that have been able to survive have survived because really that is how it is. I mean, we we are basically in that zone of growing in that direction. And so after Silver Spring, we opened up Germantown. Actually, it was about eight to 10 years later. And it took time because to build an audience took time. And I think that is another factor of business. Like sometimes we expect instant results. We think, okay, we're going to open up a business and it's going to be super packed. Or you have amazing promotion and you open up a business and it is super packed, but then the next day, nobody's there. You know what I mean? So you have to create a level of consistency. So you start and you provide a great service and great food, something that you believe in and you keep it consistent day to day to day to day to day. And you stay optimistic because realistically, I mean, the first few days, I think the first day we sold like 10 pupusas, it was like, super slow and it stayed like that for a while and then we would have a ton of people that would come in and be like do you guys have tacos do you guys have burritos do you have nachos do you have arepas <laughs> like a whole list of menu items that we did not have i was like no no we don't have that but we have pupusas we have sopas people like things i've never heard of they would leave and then sometimes they would come back sometimes they wouldn't but it was kind of like that building of like, okay, they're really only doing Salvadoran food. This is what they're doing. So, and it started to grow in that direction. And I, you know, there were other pupuserias, but they were focusing mostly on pupusas. And we called ourselves a pupuseria, but we explored obviously other things beyond just pupusas, which of course is our bread and butter, right? Our top selling item. But it was not the major focus. We really wanted to focus it on the whole Salvadoran food experience. Now, as we went to Germantown, it really was like a pop-up concept. Like how can we move this concept, which is La Casita, to another location and kind of build a smaller concept because that was a smaller location um, with a smaller menu and really focusing in on that community's needs. And I think that was another factor because like we really 
try to consider that. Like La Casita can be flexible. So we have a menu in La Casita Silver Spring, but in Germantown, let's go with a smaller menu. Let's go with a, a different concept, diff things that this community would be more interested in. And we did that with Germantown and it succeeded. It did well. It was able to be like, okay, yeah, this works well for this community. Then we moved into Gaithersburg, which was our first full service restaurant concept. And we call it Cocina Se A because it's actually Central American food. And that was really blending our lives because my husband is from Costa Rica. My brother's wife is from Nicaragua. We were kind of mixing in Central America into our life where we just, it wasn't just Salvadoran food we were eating. We were also eating Costa Rican food. We were eating Nicaraguan food. We had, we had some Hondureño food. So we really loved all those foods. And as you know, most of those foods all have similar ingredients. So basically we were like, okay, we can just change different elements, change different spices, work this out a little bit, learn how to make it, like have people that we know from those areas come and taste it. And then we kind of focused in on that. And that is a very, another kind of experimental standalone concept in Gettysburg. But that area is extremely diverse, has tons of different ages. Um, and so that, it, that restaurant has been very successful there based on the fact that it really does understand the area. And so that people feel like it's theirs, you know, like, and I think, that's what it is. Like when you have a great restaurant, you feel like it's yours. Like that's my spot. Like that's my place, you know, and you tell your friends, come check out my spot, you know, because you feel connected because it, there's something about it that makes you feel like it's your part of your life, part of your identity, you know? And so, and we love to see as well, like kids that came with their parents and as they get older they come as adults and they bring their girlfriends and then they get married and then they bring their kids so you know because like la casita silver spring we're talking about 2002 where it's already 19 years you know of being there so and at the gatesburg location was super great and we started to explore having cultural events um, we started to explore having vegan pop-ups, which talked about different ways of eating, how we can invoke plant-based eating into a food that you already love. Um, and we started to talk about those things. So I think that we really started to kind of expand out and have different conversations with food, music, and culture within that location. Um, and from that one, we ended up opening Nats Park which was a dream for my brothers mostly who are really big sports fans um and they you know were so excited for this opportunity you know they reached out to us uh, as their potential um pupuseria that they were looking at to to represent nationals park because they were really starting to um explore having local restaurants at that's park versus just your traditional um, foods of hot dogs and stuff. So they really wanted to explore that. And um, they started to bring in different restaurants that you see there. Um, and they were like, okay, we think you'd be a great fit. And obviously a big factor for us was like, okay, we will go, but we will only go if we can make pupusas on site. We're not sending frozen pupusas. We're not going to make them beforehand and just serve them. We have to make them on site and we have to have a pupusera actually making them like it's like you know making them there and serving them and so we're they're like okay we can make that work so um you know that's kind of how that was and, and we even call it pupusas and baseball i mean that's the, the chaos <laughs> because we really wanted to understand pupusas and baseball the concept yeah. it seems insane because we never thought that that would be something that could be and we're still educating people like literally every almost every week i would have somebody like what are pupusas like asking me they've never even had one they never they don't know what region it's from it's from El salvador or anything so you know, you make these assumptions that everybody knows because in your area, the DMV, obviously this specific area, pupusas are so well known, but a lot of people, you know, go to Nats Park that are from different areas that come from different countries. So it was kind of a lovely experience to be able to share that and, and people just get so excited. They're like, oh my gosh, it's like home cooked meal at Nats Park. It's so great. So that's been another super fun experience for us. And then we opened up La Cosecha, 
which is a first time in a food mark market hall um, concept. And actually that's really, we were just so inspired by the concept here, which was one, it was in the New York market district, which is full circle because my parents and us, we used to shop there in the union market. And that's before when it was like a bunch of, you know, food uh, hub locations where the, you could get me meats and vegetables and like all your dry goods. And obviously that is changing that it's really, it's really a completely different area now. And we actually just did a documentary with my brother called union, um, it's called the market. And it's, they're going to start to introduce it well, he started to introduce it a couple months ago um, and different, um, different uh, film festivals um, with documentaries and it's amazing. And we were like, it's so crazy. Like we're doing a documentary about Union Market and the full circle moment I'm talking about, which is basically when we used to come as kids and now we have a location here, you know, like it's just such a unusual way that life works, you know, sometimes when you have these opportunities um, to do things that you love and you do it with love and you do it with passion and you really believe in whatever project you're doing and you know it's, things open up experiences open up and so this spot is perfect for that because one we're the Salvadorian only only, only Salvadoran spot in the hall representing um, Salvadoran food obviously and another one is because we really do get to explore cultural events we've been able to do art events music events, um, uh, a lot of different uh, learning events. They have a culinary immersion kitchen where you can do teaching of classes of food. So it's been able, like be, we've been able to really explore that going forward, you know, um, forward as far as what we love about what we do, which is not only just selling pupusas and not only just selling our food, but really just focusing in on how we can sell our food, but how our food can give you an experience, how our coming to La Casita will may feel different than going to another place, you know? So I think that that's kind of how we've looked at it. And every location is special. Every location is different. And we're doing different things at every location to really focus in on what that community wants. You know, and uh, our DC location, we have a huge plant-based menu because that area really craves plant-based food. So, and it's been wonderful because it's something that we've been wanting to do. And now we can have a full menu at a location where people can get, you know, pupusas that are dairy free and, and platano balls and things that we, you know, actually love, um, tofu, chicharron, you know, so just really creating something that they will love and that will taste like a Salvador, you know, so um, I think that that's a really, a really cool factor um, as far as, you know, being in the experience at La Cosecha. Ah. That's what you <laughs> there, there's so many there's so many ways I can take this <laughs> you, you have such a rich family history there Edie before that though if you're if you if you reside in the DMV area and you're from Latin America originally you know or you've heard of pupusas but for those of us hearing us or looking or viewing us our audience can you briefly explain to them what is a pupusa please Sure. So basically a pupusa is a corn um, masa and it's stuffed with cheese. And traditionally you would do a chicharron or pork chicharron, but you can do other things. We do chicken and beef and beans um, or loroco, which is a Salvadoran flour bud. Um, and then you basically stuff it inside and then you cover the masa again. And at that point it becomes like a, a stuffed uh like a stuffed a corn masa cake kind of thing. Um, it's thick, but it's it's like between a medium and to a to like like a medium thickness. It's not like a super thick um, uh, shell. And then you cook it on the griddle in a really hot temperature. Um, and it takes you know it's, it it gives you know about six to eight minutes. And then you serve it with a curtido, which is a fermented cabbage. And then a salsa, which is like a red sauce, a tomato red sauce, a roasted red tomato sauce. And then that's the traditional way we, we serve it. And, and you can choose different besides cheese. You can mix it with also meat or just meat and different options, right? 
Exactly, exactly. And right now we actually have our Bubusa of the Month, which is the El Oriente, which is from the region that we come from, which is the eastern part of El Salvador, and which is La Unión specifically. And it's made with quesillo, which we imported from El Salvador. Um, and it's like a very, it's a richer cheese, it's extremely melting quality to it. Um, but it's a fresh cheese and a chicharron. So, and we serve it with a creamy coleslaw and the black sauce instead of the traditional way. So it's like a fun thing, especially since we're coming to, you know, um, our Salvador Independence Day and Hispanic Heritage Month. So we really wanted to focus in a little bit on, on the area where our family is from. You know, the funny thing is I, I grew up in DC. I, I came here at a young age. I, I was born in Nicaragua wow. and I, I immigrated here very young and I grew up in the Mount Pleasant, DC, uh, Columbia Road area. So when you mentioned El Gavilan, I, I clearly remember walking with my mother. We used to live on Harvard Tree going down towards the zoo. Mm -hmm. um, so I just make a left on Mount Pleasant and then you have there all the international Latin American grocery stores. Um, and I didn't know your family, your parents were part of El Gavilan. But where, where in Mount Pleasant did they originally have that first one? It was on Columbia Road. Oh, it was on Columbia Road. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So it was basically, yeah, right before kind of uh, where you saw all those shops and like all the different restaurants and like that strip. So it was like right at the beginning of the strip on Columbia Road. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they had also the restaurant in P uh, Piney Ranch, El Gavilan? Yes. In here, Tacoma Park and Langley Park <laughs> around there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, I did. <laughs> I know, right? There is a, what a small, history. What a small world. I clearly remember um, growing up, my parents taking me to El Gavilan, to the restaurant there, where uh, there used to be the movie theaters, like right there in that yeah, same block. I used to go to that movie theater all the time. <laughs> <laughs> when my parents were working, they're like, okay, we're going to take you to the movies and you, we could come back and get you. <laughs> yeah, right there by the giant. And then, and then as I got older, I had my own children and I took them there too for them to try the food. It, it, it's, it's great. <laughs> That's so wonderful. That's what I mean. Like, I love that because you have a very distinct food memory there yes. of those experiences. I think that's so cool. And yeah, they definitely have a very rich history in, um, in this area. And they, we were actually just featured in the um, Anacostia Smithsonian Museum. It's a community museum and uh, in this exhibit called Food for the People. And basically focusing on that, on the history of it, how it started from Gavilan and now it's like La Casita. So if anyone can go check that out, it's fantastic. It'll be there for one year. It's a whole exhibit focusing on um, food policy, food culture, and really understanding where food comes from and like why and where and how we can, you know, better our food policy. So I think it's a really, really cool thing for everyone to go check out. I'm, I'm curious, Edis, when your parents sat you down a while ago and they wanted to bring the whole family together, all the siblings, and form La Casita, were you then, I know your experience obviously growing up in the food and the restaurant industry was always there in front of you, but were you doing something else differently or did you want to do it or what were your thoughts back then when that meeting happened and that conversation? Well, at that time, I was um, actually just finishing college. So um i had a moment in my life where i was thinking well i don't know i don't know what i want to do i think that it was so hard for me at that point to make a strong decision but i did go into the private sector for two years i was working still on the weekends and helping out um and so i would i would come and everything and, and i enjoyed it i always enjoyed being with my family i enjoyed working i enjoyed being part of that whole situation but i think that i needed to find the area that interested to me the most, which was the area of the food, you know, that was where I wanted to find a way to connect. And so I ended up going to culinary school, which was the second part of my life. And I went to culinary school and I really got in touch with understanding not only food, how food is made, where food comes from, and understanding how food is such a representative part of our every day, but it's not thought about a lot. You know, it's just like a secondhand notion sometimes. You just eat, but you're not thinking about where does this food come from or how is it made or the effort, you know, which is another factor that we've we've talked a lot about, which is immigrant food sometimes gets a bad rap as far as being like it should be cheap or people should not be paying a high price for it, or it should be something like, okay, well, this is not really like 
elite food. It's not great food. It's not, you know, it's not on that level. It's, you know, and I think that when you look at the craftsmanship into making anything that is very traditional to that country, you can try to make it and it will not taste the same. And I've heard so many people say that, oh my gosh, I try to make it. I found the recipe on some website and it was like not the same. I don't understand what is going on. And it's because it's craftsmanship and that is, there is not like, it's, it's an invisible thing. It's not like, it's not tangible. You can't understand why, but it's because they've made 10,000 pupusas. How are you going to compare yourself to someone who has made 10,000 pupusas? You cannot, you cannot make the same thickness. You can't make the same texture. It's something in the hands. It's, it's something in the way it tastes. It, it, it just is. And so I think that was my passion, like really becoming a pupusa ambassador. That's been kind of my connotation of under, make, making people understand that food should be respected at all its levels always, but thought about, like make a notion to understand this food is rooted in so many generations from my mom to my grandma, to her great grandma, like so many levels that not only represent me as a person in 2021, first generation, now raising my own daughters, and their experience my like my daughter is like a better pupusa maker than me at this point. I mean, she's amazing. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? And it's because and she's like, it's in the hands, mom. It's in the hands. So <laughs> she's like, and it's so amazing to me to see that because that is really for me where my passion came from. So when I did finish culinary school, I came back to the business, but I came back, you know, at really focusing on the culinary aspect. And that's, you know, became the culinary director, really focusing on what our menu is going to look like, what what is the direction we're taking, and really incorporating culture fully in every sense of the word and between the conversation, the education, and bringing it to as many people's attention as possible. Because for me, the greatest gift is for someone to ask me, so where does this come from? Or why is this? Or why is this? Because I feel like that is the conversation that is going to get things started where people are going to really start to connect and understand is just by asking. If you don't know, then just ask. And you get to know me better. You get to know my food better. You get to know my culture better. And you and it creates a, a deeper connection. So I think that it's the same with a company, you know, and I feel like people have really connected to La Casita and I feel always so proud and so thankful because I know that is beyond me. It's beyond my brothers. It has my parents' history and my grandparents' history. It's a very unique experience to be part of something that is multi-generational at this point, because if my parent grandfather may not open that store, my mom may have never had any desire to have a business of her own. You know what I mean? So it really did come down from, from, from them. So that's kind of how we look at it. I love it. I, I also like, you said earlier, how with different locations, you also modify the menu depending on the community. It, it, do you go that, do you do that originally or do you listen to them first and then go from there? How, how does that come about? So basically what we did is we started off always with a smaller menu and then we start to get feedback from our customers um, and they would tell us, okay, we, we want this or we don't have this or why don't you have this? And then we start to kind of really figure out, okay, you know, like how can we get this? And then we would just adjust the menu accordingly. So I think that we always started out with a base, like even like Asita's menu in Gatesburg, we started out, we looked at the first menu, it looks nothing like the menu right now. Like, almost completely different because we were like, okay, these items were not working, but we move quickly. I feel like we just, we cannot sit on the menu and be like, okay, this is the menu we want. And this is what we're going to have, you know, because we realized people were not ordering that people don't want that or people would order that and they don't want that anymore. So, or people's chase, tastes are changing. They don't, you know, they want smaller menus. Like before, like food had to be this huge plate, you know what I mean? Like a food, like you have to have a lot of rice, you have to have a lot of this, you have to have a lot of that. And we're really seeing people want to try a little of everything. They sometimes don't want a full meal. They want a little small of this, they want a little small of this, and, and they want to try multiple things. And that's where really seeing people also have changed the way that they want their meal presented to them versus the way they wanted it originally, which was the one, the biggest plate you could possibly find. <laughs> But in front of them, because to them, value was on quantity. That's how they saw the value. But now they rather have an experience where they can try multiple things of different different flavors, different tastes, 
and they feel like a little bit more connected that way you know what i mean so i think that that has a lot to do with that the way we we change things at your la cosecha location you said is that where you're doing plant-based mm -hmm. yes and yeah and based on that location we realized that the other locations are very interested in that so this week we're rolling out a plant-based menu and also in Gaithersburg and Silver Spring because we just have people through social media or through you know through our um email list kind of have people just respond to us on surveys letting us know that they want more plant-based options and sometimes it's not necessarily because they're vegan but because they, they can't eat dairy anymore um they have different allergies and i think that they just really want to have our rt that that they can still enjoy the food but or like not maybe just them but someone in their family maybe their their child or their partner so that's also another thing you know when you think about food you think okay not only what i want to eat but what does everyone in my family want to eat so sure. that's another struggle you want to make sure to like please everyone right so that's another another factor. So we're so excited to be able to include that now also in Silver Spring and Gatesburg. That that's so great to hear. I, I I've never ate Salvadorian food plant based. I, I oh, can't wait God. to try it. I, I've eaten Salvadorian food all the time, but yeah. not plant based. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> and, and, and I'm sure. I mean, you you would want the taste to sort of remain the same. So that's that's, that's pretty much standard, right? Exactly. Yeah, I make sure that that like I make sure like I make, you know, everyone in my family try it and friends like try and make sure you like it. What do you think? And then they're like, oh, I love it. It tastes great. It tastes, you know, because think about it, like we just are doing our LC tacos, you know, which are their two are made on the two Salvadorian tortillas with the meat, but we're using impossible beef versus traditional beef and we're using chimol, which is already obviously plant-based and then we're using a yeast-based cheese instead of a queso seco so you know you have all the flavorings are there you got your tortilla you have your chimol you have your queso flavor which is a saltiness that you need for your tacos and then you're good you know and so i think that you kind of have to think about like the elements it's all about if you really focus in on the ingredients you realize aguacate you know avocado chimol which is like our pico de gallo version and then you have tortillas these basic our beans obviously rice are all plant-based naturally so it's not like you know we have to make these huge adjustments we just have to make be aware that this is a very particular menu for a particular group but anyone can enjoy it you know what i mean and so i think that's kind of where we really focused in on on the plant-based it is now you have silver spring germantown gaithersburg nationals park in la cosecha right so five location. I'm curious, I'm in commercial real estate and just also for our audience, if someone's listening and they want to start the restaurant, how do you go about selecting that right location? What do you well, look at? Well, yes. I mean, I think for us, we have looked at a few factors. Um, the first location, the first location in Silver Spring we were looking at, we were definitely looking for a diverse um, audience, a diverse, a diverse customer base. And I think that that was a big factor. We wanted to be able to have people from different ethnicities, obviously Salvadoreños, which was our big, big, you know, bulk of our customer base. Um, and, you know, different ages, obviously, you know, um, younger to older as well. So initially that is what we looked in. And obviously Silver Spring is that. Um, and then we kind of, when we looked into Germantown, Gaithersburg, and then obviously our newer locations, Nationals Park, obviously you don't think about that, but because it's kind of an entertainment situation, it kind of creates a different environment. Um, and then obviously with La, Cos with La Cosecha, which is obviously already a based in built in audience based mm -hmm. on the fact that people are going for Latin American food. But if you are looking, I think a big factor has to be, okay, what type of food will you be offering? Are you going to be offering a situation where you're going to want people to be able to drive there or can they walk there? And that's going to be a factor on age. Obviously, um, families prefer locations with good parking. You know, if you're looking for a young millennial crowd, you're going to be looking for places where they can get there biking, walking with, you know, try, you know, some kind of other form of transportation that's not necessarily a car. So I think that 
And then as you go further and further, further down generations, it's going to be different things and really have to focus in on that. But it's going to what's going to matter is basically what's your menu? What are you offering? Because the food is very specific. We have what you consider to be very ethnic, cultural food, cultural based food. Now, obviously, for our generation, we're definitely getting into it because now I feel like a lot of the younger crowd is more interested because of the fact that they're more intrigued about how like who am i what do i represent you know what i mean versus before which was like more of a like i don't care about that part of myself <laughs> like i'm american that's it like that part of my life doesn't matter which was a lot of you know um that that being that first generation right kind of vibe so but now it's very different i think that cultural food ethnic food connected food is something that even young people now enjoy you know what i mean it's not something that they're feeling that like that's like my mom's food you know and um i've seen that a lot as well but things change and so you have to remember that even with whatever location you get a location can change because you can have a demographic this year but in 10 years it may be completely different so you have to be aware of that as well like nothing is static so you as a business cannot stay static and that's another factor so i think that that's of course a great thing a great beginning because you're looking at the size you want to make sure that it fits what you're going to be selling the a capacity you're going to want that it's going to have good viewing so people are going to be able to see it that you if it's like within a, a complex of some kind it makes sense for your business to be there you don't have too much competition. I mean, there's a lot of things that you have to factor in, but I think that ideally, sometimes you just have to feel it just the way when you buy a home, you know, you go and you see the space and you feel the space and you're like, okay, this space makes sense. And that's the, really the only way because on paper, numbers, all of that makes sense. But if you don't feel like this is your spot, if you don't feel like, oh, this is great, this is gonna work out, it's just not gonna be, it's not gonna be a good thing. So I think that that's, at the end, once you've done all your research, you go and you have to make sure that the space gives you the energy, that this is this is your spot, so. Uh, it's so true, it's, it's so funny, before we got on this, maybe 15 minutes ago, I got an email from a client saying that they wanted to look at this one retail space. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, great. I sent you a survey already of multiple locations. How about we pick a few more? Just like that, like you're looking at a house, you need to feel it, you need to see it, you're going to get that gut feeling. Mm -hmm. Also, not just one, and it, it just it literally just happened a couple minutes ago before we jumped on. Yeah, exactly. You need to have multiple spots. Of course, all of them should make sense, right, for what you're looking of for, course. size and everything else. But once like you get there, you'll know. And like we felt it for every single spot that we've looked, we walked through, we, we were like, oh, yes, this definitely feels right. You know, and it's not like they were amazing inside. Some of them really had to have some work done initially, but it had the bones, it had what you wanted. It had, you know, because most businesses will not be like manufactured for you. Like you will have to make some adjustments to make it what you're trying to do, what you're trying to sell. So I think you will never find that perfect spot, but you will find that perfect feeling. Yeah, I agree hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. What would you say drives and motivates you today? Well, for me, I think my greatest motivation now has just been my desire, my just my desire to really express every day my passion for food, not only for food, but food culture, food history. Um, and I think that with La Casita, it's like so perfect because it really is that, you know, I have conversations with my mom. She's I always call her semi-retired because she's retired, but never really <laughs> retires. She always wants to do a little check-in every once in a while. Conversations about food all the time. Mom, what do you think about this? She's like, no, I think daughter, we should do, you should do this. Or maybe think about this. You know, we used to do this back in the day. And like different thoughts and just really talking to her about food is such a connector. And I, I love that. And the fact that I get to work with my my siblings and work every and with my husband and my daughter who also is part of our company now she's 21 so it's such a lovely thing to do and literally like move it along to the next generation and not only that but have all these people believe in us as a company 
is so huge, especially during the pandemic. It was so heartwarming to not only be involved with so many amazing organizations where we're giving food and, and doing all these great work with them and just have people just giving us shout outs and really being there for us and supporting us. I always felt like, wow, like it's such a great blessing to be able to be doing a business that not only has significance economically, but it has some kind of significance historically in their lives. You know what I mean? So I think that that for me is is a gift and I'm I'm thankful to have some kind of platform to be able to share it. So that's uh, always a great thing. That's great. You know, having the right team is so important, especially now with what we all went through with COVID. And I know a lot of the restaurant industry got impacted, unfortunately, so then closed down and a lot of them lost staff and trying to get it back in there. How do you go about finding the right people? Well, I think we always go, we have always basically gone through a really rigorous kind of initial interview um, where we just kind of really just talk to you. And I think that that's a big factor. We're not huge on these like generalized questions, like where do you see yourself in five years? Or Because I don't feel like, especially in the restaurant industry, that makes a lot of sense. Some people are not even thinking about being in the restaurant industry for five years. Like it's, it's a very, you know, it's in and out kind of business. It's just, it is, you know, you have young people, they go off to college and then they don't come back, you know, or you have, um, you know, someone who is, a, you know, a, thinking about having children soon and then they have children and then they don't come back. So there's many things in and out we have to understand. Like, it's not like, okay, you're going to have this employee and they're going to be with you forever. So we really just talk to you. We, we like talk to them. Do you know a little bit about La Casita? Do you, you know, and if you don't, then we tell you about La Casita, what La Casita is, when it started, a little history. And then we just kind of let you in, like let you talk to us. Like, what are you thinking about? Like, wh what do you see yourself? What do you what do you like about this industry? Like, simple questions that to me don't feel like we're trying to. I don't know, like give you some kind of uh, pop quiz or anything, because I feel like it's really we need to know if you are right fit. We need to know if you're interested, because for us, it's just as important that we're interested as the fact that you're interested. Because if you're not interested, it won't matter how hard we train you, how much information we give you, how many years you work, you will never feel passionate, you will never feel excited, you will never feel invested in, in our company, you won't. And we have employees that we've had 10, 15 years in some of our locations, and they have been with us all this time, not because of some kind of like magic, you know, thing, you know, that's, you know, like you have to be with us. Like it's, they're there because they feel happy. They feel comfortable. They like their job because as you know, with the shortage has been with, with people at restaurants and, and kitchen and dining room, huge shortage and, and people wanting to go back into this industry. We are so thankful that we have not been so majorly affected where some people have literally had to shut, you know, cut down their hours, like close certain days because they cannot, they can't, they don't have anyone to work. We haven't been, had to do that. We've been able to have the employees we've had from, from before that pandemic stay through with us throughout the pandemic and then have some new employees come on post pandemic, I guess, you know, we're still in pandemic, but as a strong point, you know, where everything was shutting down. And that is what it is to us. It's, it's a conversation, you're going to be part of our family, part of our soca. We, we care about you as an individual. And I think that is that simple. And we, we have learned that from our parents. That's the way they used to do their interviews. That's the way they used to focus in. And they had the same result, because people want to feel appreciated. And they want to feel like you care, you know what their name is, you know who they are, you know, and if they're from Isabella, what area they're from, you know what I mean? And it's, it's a very specific thing. And I think food and the food industry should be taken that way. It should have a more personalized effect even when you hire someone because people don't want to just feel like robots making food because it's not what it is, you know? So um i i think that especially being in the kitchen i i learned that a very important factor you are so tired you're sweating you're hungry you know and you're like 
making this food and then you have someone coming yelling in your face it's not a good feeling you know what i mean like it's not so i think that we are very aware of that so that's what, what i say what advice would you give someone Edie, that was starting off any business whether restaurant or non-restaurant related i always say the first thing to do is kind of build out some kind of plan i you know these long 15, 20 page business plans, I don't think are necessary. I think if you can just have a blueprint, okay, what is it I want? What do I want? Whether it be a brick and mortar, which is great, or an e-commerce, which is also fantastic, or maybe a combination of both, which is amazing as well. And I think that that's a wonderful thing that you can really um, create any kind of business you want at this point, because the fact is that even food businesses can exist, not necessarily under a brick and mortar concept anymore, you know? So I think that that is the first thing. So you need to figure out what it is that you want. The second thing is that you need to figure out who can help you get there. And there's a ton of different sites. Obviously you can go to, you know, your local chamber of commerce, wherever you are and start that way. You can go to your local library and just start kind of doing some research and figuring out, you know, maybe different organizations in your area that are focusing in on whatever trade you're doing. So in our case, obviously, it's a restaurant association. You can reach out to them. They offer sometimes mentoring programs, sometimes just online seminars, sometimes just really become um, a professional like asker of just figuring out everything. Ask other restaurant owners or other businesses, if, just go to them. I have had so many people just come and email me. Then my email is on the website. Email me and ask me, like, what do you think about this? And I always will answer, you know, or if someone has asked me directly, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And then I answer them. People want to help. For the most part, they want to help. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, you're giving some kind of crazy secrets, you know, like, just ask. And most people will be willing to help and then the third thing is start small start small and start focused like whatever you're gonna do don't try to do a million things like if you're gonna open up a coffee house like don't do a million types of coffee you know focus in on a few like your basic coffee and a few great coffee options start small because we started with just pupusas i mean before anything else we started with a market we didn't even start with a pupusa like so we started with a market and then became a pupusa like no, no one really ends where they began, right? So start small, start where you don't have to have so much money to invest, so much time to invest. And, you know, start small, selling small things, you know, like maybe even going to local festivals or, um, you know, we're going to be at the Launch Branch Festival this weekend. There are a lot of vendors there that don't have brick and mortars that are going to be there, you know, that you're going to be selling their stuff. And then people ask, do you have this somewhere else? Are you selling this? Like there's ways for people to try your product, try your food, get yourself out there get yourself a social media account start posting start taking photos start getting people interested and that's the way because you don't need to and there's really no specific way right but there is a way to do it where it's the most efficient and the less time consuming and you spend the less money you know what i mean because it is expensive to start a business but it can be great it could be a better experience for you if you have as much knowledge as much help and as much um feedback because that's very important you need them to tell you this sucks and like and if it sucks why you know what i mean like oh this is no good i don't like this because of this and this and this or this is amazing because of this is and this you need to have that feedback it, it sucks sometimes you hear it and nobody wants to hear it. i didn't like this you know but that feedback sometimes is even more helpful than saying i loved it because that is the one that helps you okay i'm doing something wrong let me let me let me go back let me see what i did wrong and then try to do it again so i think that's my advice a very big focusing on just you know really diving into what it is that you want without just 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 doing those steps without just without having to do a single thing as far as putting down any kind of down payment or investment or getting someone to invest in you. None of that, just focus in on the small things because even an investor wants to see something. They want to see that you have something that is worth investing in. And if you can show that, if you already have 
traction, if you already have a great social media following, if you already have like that background where you've been doing all this back work, they're going to be believing you more because they're going to know that this is that you're really passionate about this. So um, I think that that's another factor as well. So, you know, it, it's so true. It just when you just said that as far as social media following it just brings up, uh, I had a client of mine who started with a pop up uh, for a, a restaurant, just pop up store, just restaurant in a more of a warehouse space in mm-hmm. Rockville and grew the following and Instagram through there through time. And then at a point he was able to graduate and we found him a new space in that North Bethesda Rockville area. But that following goes a long ways, especially when you're presenting yourself to a landlord or any, anyone else like that. And it's sort of your first location technically. Exactly. Yeah. People want to believe in something that other people believe in. I mean, that's just how it goes. I mean, because you don't have like street cred yet, right? You don't have it. Exactly. Like, oh, yes, I can vouch for this person. They are, they are an amazing business person because you don't have a business. Like it's easy to come in when you've had, you know, a whole portfolio of businesses. Everyone will believe in you. But if you're just starting, people won't. And I think that that's you and it sucks because you feel like we everyone should believe in me yes everyone will believe in you but you need to remember that people need to have some kind of like um something for you to show me that this is something worth investing in so that's kind of how it goes especially because small businesses have such a huge failure rate i mean that's just a reality so it's a hard thing to do but when you succeed, you succeed. It can and can last you for the rest of your career. It's, it is what it is. You know what I mean? It's one of those things that has high risk but high reward. So. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. What would you say is your biggest challenge right now with your role at La Casita? Um, I think my biggest challenge is you know juggling things. You know because I think that for me, I feel like. There's a lot of things that we have up in the air always, right? Like we're juggling things all the time ideas, concepts, thoughts, what's going on for 2022, our team building. Um, There's a a lot of little things going on all the time. And sometimes it's hard to focus in on one thing. And I think that that's been like the hardest thing for us recently. It's just like, okay, what of all these things up in the air needs our attention the most right now? Because I think that if you don't do that, everything stays up in the air and you don't really do anything. (laughs) You just become static and you're just like, what happened? We didn't do anything. And that's the reality because I feel like that's kind of how you have to run a business because there's so many little micro little things happening all the time. And so it's hard to focus in on those big things. And so for me, that's what we do. Okay. We have our weekly team meeting. We talk about the things we have to do, but then we end at the meeting. We say, okay, what do we have to get done by next week? And then we sit down and we make sure we get it done and then we remind each other and then we like keep each other on track and we get it done because if we don't then it stays up in the air because it's just a reality that sometimes when you have all the burners burning you will forget about one of those things and something will burn you know so you have to really just focus in on what you're doing stay on track and it's going to be your best thing it is coming to an end here what does the future look like what does the next couple of years look like for you and la casita well, for us and for La Casita, for myself and for La Casita, I see continued growth. Um, uh, we would probably like to open it up another Pupusaria within the next two years. Um, that's kind of the goal. Um, and then really focusing in on how we want to move La, La Casita going forward. I mean, I think at the end of the day, I think that we have had that conversation many times about where does La Casita go from here? Do we want to expand it to other parts of the country? Do we want to expand it outside of the DMV? Like a lot of questions have come to that point. You know, we we have a strong desire to do that, but obviously we want to make sure to have the strong support that we need. And that's kind of how we've always done things. We want to make sure to take our time to do whatever we do. But of course, we would love to bring La Casita to other parts of the country, bring our story to other parts of the country. That would be a fantastic thing to do, um, especially because pupusas are just becoming such a loved um, food item at all and, and anywhere. You know what I mean? So 
I think that that's something really exciting. And I think it'd be cool for other people to try a DC version of a pupusa, right? The DMV version of a pupusa, which is our version. So um, I think that that's a cool thing. So we definitely are looking forward to that, to be able to expand outside of the DMV area, so. I, I love that. Where can people find out more about you and La Casita? Well, um, you can go to our website, www.lacasitapupusas.com. You can follow us on social media at La Casita Pupusas on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and by location on Facebook, just put La Casita on which location you're looking for. And then you can find me um, at Chef Iris Jimenez on Instagram as well. Edis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You had an awesome time and really appreciate it. Thank you. It went by so fast. I know. <laughs> That's what Let happens when you have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Take care.